Hello, everyone. Today we will work our way through books 7 and 8 of the Aeneid. We'll cover the outbreak of war in Italy, and we'll end with a look at Aeneas's new shiny armor from the gods. At the beginning of Book 7, Aeneas and the Trojans finally sail into the mouth of the Tiber River and arrive at their fated destination, the region of Italy called Latium. Here the people are called Latins, a subset of the Italians, and their ruler is a king named Latinus. Book 7 begins the second half of the Aeneid, and so Virgil inserts a second proem. It reads as follows, quote, Now come, Arato. Who were the kings, the tides, and the times? How stood the old Latin state when that army of intruders first beached their fleet on Italian soil? All that I will unfold, I will recall how the battles first began. And you, goddess, inspire your singer. Come. I will tell of horrendous wars, tell of battle lines, and princes fired with courage, driven to their deaths. Etruscan Italians, all Hesperia, called to arms. A greater tide of events springs up before me now. I launch a greater labor, end quote. After the first half of the Aeneid largely resembled the Odyssey, with some of the Argonautica thrown in as well, the second half of the epic will resemble the Iliad. He will, Virgil will tell of a massive war that engulfs Italy, and it takes all of Book 7 to explain what caused this war. To explain the cause of the war, it is best to take Virgil's cue and use the Iliad as a frame of reference. Latinus is the king of Latium, and he has a daughter named Lavinia. Latinus's wife Amata wants Lavinia to be married to a fellow Latin, a local warlord named Turnus. However, a series of prophecies warned Latinus that he must marry his daughter not to a local prince, but to a foreigner. Therefore, when Aeneas and the Trojans reach his shores, he asks that Aeneas be the one who marries Lavinia. Juno is not happy about this arrangement, and sees the opportunity to start a massive war to make Aeneas and the Trojans suffer still more. Quote, It's not for me to deny him his Latin throne. So be it. Let Lavinia be his bride, an iron fact of fate. But I can drag things out, delay the whole affair. That I can do, and destroy them root and branch the people of either king. Hecuba is not the only one who spawned a firebrand, who brought to birth a wedding torch of a son. Venus's son will be the same, a Paris reborn, a funeral torch to consume a second Troy, end quote. Here again we see how Juno is completely aware of what is fated to happen, but opposes fate anyway, or at least delays that fate for as long as possible. Juno also calls Aeneas a new Paris, as though Lavinia is a new Helen being stolen from Turnus, a new Menelaus. This is one way of looking at the war in Italy as a new Iliad. However, as events will turn out, Aeneas will more resemble a new Achilles, and Turnus a new Hector, Latinus a new Priam. The Trojan War will be fought in reverse, and it is now the Trojans who are the invaders. In order to start the war, Juno employs a ghastly goddess of the underworld named Electo. She is one of the Furies, with snakes for hair. The Furies inspire madness in their victims, and Electo rouses the madness of war in three ways. First, she inspires Queen Amata, who already wanted Lavinia to marry Turnus, to rally the women of Latium to her cause against the Trojans. Next, Electo fires up Turnus himself with indignation that a foreign Trojan is going to steal his bride. Lastly, Electo causes a riot of the common people of Latium by causing Aeneas' son Iulus to kill a pet stag of one of the Latins. This causes a local militia to take up arms, and first blood is shed between Trojans and Latins. Book 7 ends with a lengthy catalog of the Italian peoples and their leaders who join the cause of the Latins to drive out these foreign Trojan invaders. Much like Homer's catalog of ships, Virgil's catalog offers descriptions of the various captains and warlords, such as Mezentius and Mesapis. He includes where in Italy they came from and how many men they commanded. Virgil's readers would have recognized the various towns in Italy mentioned in this catalog, perhaps some of their hometowns or those of their ancestors. This hammers home the point that the coming war between Trojans and Latins is that between the common ancestors of the Roman people. It is in essence a civil war, much like the ones Virgil experienced during much of his life. At the beginning of Book 8, Aeneas realizes that he is far outnumbered by the Latin forces under Turnus. He is desperate for allies in the coming war. Thankfully for him, the gods are on his side, 
and he has a dream in which the god of the river Tiber directs him to sail upstream to find allies in the city of Palantium, led by an exiled Greek king named Evander. Aeneas takes a small band of men with him upstream and leaves the rest of the Trojans behind in their beachhead camp. What is interesting about Palantium is that it is the future site of the city of Rome itself. Virgil describes a, a largely rural landscape where famous buildings of the future city will one day stand. As for its inhabitants, Evander and the Arcadians receive Aeneas and the Trojans with open arms, and even tells them how to find additional allies to the north among the Etruscans. Evander and Aeneas celebrate a festival of Hercules together, and Evander tells the tale of how Hercules came to Palantium one day and got rid of a fire-breathing monster named Cacus, who had been terrorizing their land. Evander is now ready to send Aeneas off, but not before entrusting in his charge his son Pallas, a boy barely of military age. Aeneas will take a liking to this young man, and will feel honor-bound to protect him. Remember this important detail when we get to Book 10. The last section of Book 8 is much like Book 18 of Homer's Iliad. Even though Aeneas didn't really need a new set of armor, his mother Venus felt he needed some anyway, and she used her seductive charms to persuade her husband, the fire god Vulcan, to drop everything and forge the arms. As one would expect, Book 8 ends with an extensive ekphrasis of Aeneas' shield. However, this is not a description of Aeneas' own society as it was for Achilles' shield. Instead, Virgil depicts on the shield various famous events from future Roman history, events that display the glory of the Roman people, and especially of Aeneas's descendant, Caesar Augustus. As Achilles' shield represents all aspects of his society, so Aeneas's shield literally has Aeneas bearing on his shoulders the future of the Roman people. Like the vision of future Roman heroes in Book 6, Aeneas is shown on the shield exactly what he's fighting for. First, Vulcan depicts the twin founders of Rome, Romulus and Remus, being suckled by a she-wolf. He shows the abduction of the Sabine women meant to ensure Rome continues in future generations. He shows various Roman heroes defending the city against foreign invaders like the Gauls. But it is in the center of the shield that Vulcan reserves the greatest scene, the Battle of Actium between Augustus versus Antony and Cleopatra. Virgil represents this as an apocalyptic naval battle between East and West. Quote, and here, in the thick of it all, the queen is mustering her armada, clacking her native rattles, still not glimpsing the twin vipers hovering at her back, as Anubis barks and the queen's chaos of monster gods train their spears on Neptune, Venus, and great Minerva, end quote. Virgil represents it as a theomachy between Rome's gods and those of Egypt, between the feminine forces of chaos and the masculine forces of order. The struggle of Augustus at Actium foreshadows retroactively the conflict Aeneas fights in Italy against Turnus and Juno. The ekphrasis concludes with the depiction of Augustus in his triumphal parade through Rome, representing the moment when he returns to the capital to take sole control of the empire. Augustus' victory is the ultimate goal of Aeneas' victory thousands of years before. Next time, we'll wrap up the Aeneid with its final three books.